Hi everyone. We have a treat today. We're joined by Tom McClellan, and I know that name sounds familiar. Uh, Tom, uh, great to have you here. Uh, I've watched you on CNBC so many times. I even turn the volume up when you're on, and I recommend that other people do because there are many things you have said uh, that have helped reinforce a narrative I might have or open my mind up to what was I thinking? All right, so uh, I have a high degree of respect for your work. Tom, Tom is the editor of the McClellan Market Report, and he started that with his dad, Sherman, in 1995. Now, Sherman McClellan and his wife, Tom's mother, Mary Ann, are co-creators of the McClellan Oscillator and the Summation Index. Uh, and that was back in 1969. Uh, Tom, I don't think you could go to any charting service anywhere where you don't see, uh, you know, what your parents created, the McClellan Oscillator sitting there on the chart, the Summation Index. Uh, uh, they were pioneers. They were, and they uh, they were tinkering around with uh, exponential moving averages, which had only been invented in the, in the 1950s. Uh, they, the, that math was introduced to the investing public by a guy named Pete Harland or P.N. Harland, who wrote the Trade Levels Report. He was an actual rocket scientist at JPL who dabbled in the stock market, uh, meaning he would uh, bring his oh. IBM punch cards with stock market data uh, down to the D JPL's computer lab at night when the computer wasn't being used and he'd crunch numbers. And so he'd found that exponential moving averages were useful for tracking stock market data, just like for tracking satellites. Uh, the key insight that my parents developed uh, and the key insight that they had was, what if you look at the difference between two moving averages as opposed to just the moving averages themselves? And later, Gerald Appel picked up that same idea a few years Perfect. later and called it yeah. moving average convergence divergence or MACD. But it was my parents yeah. who first had that idea back in 1969. Wow. And, uh, you know, I used to go to KY Studios to promote you know, buying gold or a, a big trade that I would see. And I know that that's uh, where your dad really got a start was from a guy named Gene Morgan, who had a show called Charting the Market. And he started using your dad's uh, oscillator, the McClellan oscillator. Yeah, Gene, uh, my parents had watched Gene's show for, for many years. And, and, uh, and in 1969, Gene put out a call in the air, said, hey, if anybody's got something interesting that they're working on, uh, let me know. And, and I'd like to see it. And so my dad said, hey, I, I got something interesting. And he, and he showed it to Gene Morgan. And Gene Morgan made it the, a part of his show. And in fact, Gene Morgan was the, the one who coined the name McClellan Oscillator because he was showing this thing that my parents had created. And he needed to call it something when he put it on air every day. And, and the viewers liked it. So uh, that's how it really got its start. Uh, a lot of people in Southern California got to see it and be familiar with it. Um, later on, uh, there was a the first computer program it's called CompuTrack. It was for Mac computers, uh, and it was developed. and And they went; to, they wanted to be able to do technical analysis on a computer. So one of the things they did was they compiled a list of what are all the indicators that anybody would ever want to see. And McClellan Oscillator got put on that list, and as a result, it got put on the list of every other software developer that was making knockoff products. And it, it then people found out more about it around the world, and now we have subscribers on six continents. Uh, people who are aware of it, and, and uh, the internet makes that a whole lot more 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 easy to get the word out the, back than back in 1995 when we everything was printed and mailed. They don't remember, but Los Angeles was a financial media hub. FNN was there before mm -hmm. they went to CNBC at KYTV. You had radio stations like K-Money Radio. Yeah. There was a lot of um, activity and interest in the Southern California area. Now we've just been, you know, left to the internet <laughs> but well, uh, re and remotely showing up there. 
I, I think that the difference it lies in West Coast thinking versus stodgy uh, traditional East Coast thinking of we've all done it that, that way. People who pick up and move to California were free thinkers, I would say, yeah. generally, and willing to undertake new ideas more so than the people who stayed back East. And so uh, that led to and, and fed the, the willingness to try and to accept doing financial media on TV before it had ever been done anywhere else. Yeah, uh, is, they were amazing times and, you know, uh, so many different ways to ride the waves. And in fact, that's probably where John Bollinger came up with his concept sitting out there on his board. So uh, we were lucky to live in the, the heyday of what was happening here in Southern Cal, Tom. And uh, uh, that's why I wanted to say hello to you, because it reminds me of those days. So, OK, here we are now, decades later, Tom. And. I'm very interested, and my viewers are, in your work. Uh, I know you talked about the presidential cycle, and uh, I heard that uh, there's a stat that you came up with that I never heard of before, that if taxes are risen, go up a certain amount of years, that there's always been a recession. Can you refresh my memory on what you were talking about there? Yeah, I look at federal tax receipts, uh, which not surprisingly go up and down with the economy, okay. um, but they sometimes go up more than they should. And if you get federal tax receipts above 18% of total GDP, then you always get a recession. And we're at 18.7% right now. Uh, I, last I checked, I, I, I I don't know what the, the latest numbers are, but it's it's above 18 and it's been there. So uh, and basically the idea is that if you take too much money out of the economy in the form of taxes. Right. Where's the velocity? You, you're you're eating your seed corn and you're not leaving enough money in the economy to keep doing things that the economy needs. And you're sucking up too much of it to go to Washington, D.C. to do what uh, Congress decides they want to do with it. And even then, 18 percent is still not enough because we're spending 25 percent of GDP. And at some point, somebody's going to have to do something about that, and it won't be pleasant no matter what they do. Okay, so I see the power. Uh, the PowerPoint is it uh, pretty fundamental stuff like this? How much money is there? And uh, because I do want to touch upon markets with you. Oh, it's all going to be about markets. But, okay, well then, yeah. let, let's start with uh, uh, how do you measure how much money is, there is? And Tom, uh, you know, yeah. I remember. Do you remember Friday afternoons when we'd come home? waiting to hear what the money supply reports were oh yeah and back in the six, late 60s early 70s money supply either m1 or m2 used to correlate very strongly with the stock market on a on a contemporaneous basis uh it's got a little bit different relationship right now which is going to be what i'm going to lead off with but i wanted to make the point that there's we talk about fundamental analysis versus technical analysis, and there's really only two fundamentals when it comes to the overall stock market. How much money is there? And you you asked the right question. How do we measure that? Uh, and that's a that's a little bit of an interesting philosophical question, but it doesn't change the the principle of that being one of the fundamentals. If you if there's more money or less money, then that will affect the stock market. And also the sentiment. How much does that money want to be invested and i and i put the the sentiment on the money because you or i might have an opinion about something but how important our opinion is to the market it is dependent on how much money we got uh, riding on that opinion and that's so, our vote right yeah. uh, we we vote with our pocketbook and so if you got a bigger pocketbook you get more of a vote and and that's an uh, important relationship to understand um this is uh, the way I like to look at money supply. Uh, the red line is M2, which is a monetary aggregate, which contains uh, lots of things. It contains currency, it contains checking account, contains money market funds. So, it, and we're going to get the latest number out uh, today, a little bit later. I take M2 and I divide it by GDP so that it uh, gets normalized. And what is going on right now, which is different than what was happening in the 1960s, is that this M2 divided by GDP number it serves as a leading indicator for what the stock market's going to do with about a one-year lag time. And I, I show that by shifting this data forward by 12 months. And so when you get a huge surge in money supply, you get a hurt, huge price response. We saw yeah. a huge surge COVID. In, in 2008 and 9, which led to a big stock market rise in 2009 and 10. When that flattens out, then you get more volatile times 
when when and you get another big surge and you get a great stock market response and then when the money supply flattens out then you get a flattening out we saw a big flattening out in 2018 and 19 and into 20 uh covid led the the fed and right. the treasury to increase the money supply in a huge way and we got a huge res price response about a year later now we're trying an experiment we've never tried before, not ever in the whole history of monetary aggregates. We are shrinking M2 in real terms, and we're shrinking even more in GDP adjusted terms. We've never been through a drop in the money supply as big as this. So we know that when you have a big surge increasing the money supply, you get a right. big surge in stock prices a year later. We don't know for sure what happens when you get a big drop in the money supply, if it's going to lead to a drop a year later. And we don't know that because we never had one. Uh, so yeah. we're performing this big experiment now, and we're going to see, but uh, it can't be seen as good news for the stock market that money supply is shrinking, because when there's less money, there's less force to push the stock market up. Okay. You know, uh, I wanted to ask you, because you did not uh, go into the business right away. You were listening to the beat of a different drummer, and uh, you you went to West Point. That's right. I, I, I was a rebellious teenager. And the way that you rebel against your California upbringing is you, <laughs> you, you go to the East Coast and you join the military. And oh, uh, that was that tough for you, Tom? Oh, yeah. Uh, and I had never even seen the place. Yeah. You, know, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't even. This do... wasn't your idea. This was. Uh, no, it was my idea. Oh, OK. I, uh, I got I, I did pretty well on the the PSAT in 10th grade. And, and the fun thing then is I got love notes from all sorts of colleges saying, we'd love you to come to us. And one of them was West Point, And I read the catalog. I said, wow, that sounds pretty good. And it's free. And not only is it free, they pay you a salary to go there. I, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, did have to cut off my big fluffy afro that I had in high school. Um, in fact, I walked into the barber shop on the first day at West Point and all the barbers stopped working and they all looked at me because I my I, I I figured, why get another haircut? So it was it was pretty big and out to here and then it all went just yum, yum, and uh, because a lot of guys wash out. They can't true. they we can't started, take it. We and, started with fourteen hundred and twenty five in my class and we graduated eight hundred and sixty two. So, yeah, it was a it, it, it was tough and it is still tough. Uh, and that's uh, kind of appropriate. I've it's met people that have become traders with military backgrounds. And for uh, the reason I'm guessing is they're always assessing risk. Okay. And they're always thinking strategy. And most of all, they have discipline. You can't get through West Point without having discipline or being able to follow discipline. And then after West Point, uh, you were flying choppers. I was flew OH-58 helicopters mostly, also some time in Hueys and Cobras. Uh, I was a maintenance pilot, so that meant I went to a special school to work on helicopters and to supervise the guys that did. And so when they would uh, screw it all back together, I was the one who would take it up and make sure that it that it's passed the test and was ready to go and let the regular pilots fly it. And, and uh, what I usually did was I took the mechanic who did the work and I put him in the left seat, said, OK, you're going up with me. And uh, that was a reward for them. And it also helped show them why it's important to do it right. It was a very okay. satisfying time. You're, you're probably paying attention to different oscillators on your flight panel than the McClellan. Well, and the right? thing about pilots um, like chartists, uh, I, I see a lot of chartists who come from an a, a background in aviation and or in music. And if you're going to be a pilot or a musician, you have to be willing to accept visual information and make a decision based on it and that decision might be to level the wings or to land because you're out of gas or the decision might be to come in on the down note you have the visual information coming in and not everybody's brains work visually uh, and so not everybody's attuned to working with charts and that's okay everybody's brains are different but uh, i see a lot of people that come to uh, to appreciate chartists and charting because they come from those backgrounds because their brains are already wired that way so why in 95 did you decide it was time to pick up the mantle of well, what your parents had created? Uh, you may recall that in 1993, so, some new people came to Washington, D.C., and they realized that we weren't going to ever have wars anymore, so we don't need this big army. Let's let everyone go. And that turned out well. Uh, I was part of the peace dividend getting out in 1993 uh, when the army was drawing down. And before then, uh, I was a young captain on flight pay. 
and had had more money coming in than I needed to spend. So I, I, I had never really cared about what my parents did when I was a teenager because I already knew everything. Uh, suddenly, when I was an adult and I had a little bit more money coming in than I needed to spend, I realized I should call my dad and figure out what this investing thing is all about. And he sent that? me some books. He sent me Edwards and McGee's uh, yeah, Nicole the Bible, and Stock Trends. And uh, it made sense to me. Thought, this, this is all pretty good. I think I'd like to do this for a living. That was my first book I had a course at the Merck. That was our Bible. And, well, and it's, it's as it's valid about, now as ever. Huh? It's about this thick. So yeah. it's not easy to get through. But I, I was very interested in, in it. Couldn't put it down. It all made sense to me. And it doesn't make sense to everyone. Okay. So well, now let's get back to um, the disconnect in the market. Uh, to well, so what we, you see happening, we've Go had ahead. the Fed. We've had the Fed turning off the money spigot, and, right. and so the the we're waiting for this twelve month lag period to go by. We don't yet have the the March M two data in this. Uh, to know what it's going to do, but we're, I expect it's probably going to continue declining. We also don't know for sure if the stock market's going to match the decline. I think it's going to, but we don't know for sure. We do know that things are not going as, as strongly as they should. Um, this is the Dow and Jones Industrial Average compared to its annual seasonal pattern. And everybody on your yeah. on your air is list as knows that we're in the bullish period of seasonality. April was months. supposed to be the one yeah. the best risk on months, and I think as of today, we're lower on the month. It's it's not being it's not a very over lower on the month, Tom. It's, yeah, it's not an impressive uh, trend. You know, this is what we're supposed to be happening, and this is what's actually happening. There's uh, you. In, in the in the bullish seasonal period, people want to be invested more. Uh, you know, winter is ending. People are feeling more optimistic. The sun is out for longer every day. Everybody feels good. They want to pour their money in. Uh, when the, and when the summer gets here and the day starts getting shorter, people feel like pulling in. And so that's why September and October ten, typically tend to be weak as the sunlight is, is less long and, and you feel less optimistic. But we're not doing very much with, with all the, that bullish tailwind of seasonality. And we're also not doing very well uh, in the presidential cycle pattern, which is basically seasonality with a four-year period instead of a one-year period. Uh, during the first two years of President Biden's term in office, the S&P 500 matched the presidential cycle pattern pretty well. We're in what is supposed to be the bullish third year. The third year is nearly always an up year for the stock market. But it's a pretty underwhelming response by the stock market. We're not racing higher. We're not making new highs like we normally do in the third year. It's a, it's pretty unimpressive what's happening. And, and pretty because, pretty thin as far as participation, AD, Exactly. We're seeing this is the, the advanced decline line, which is a cumulative total of all daily advances minus declines. It changes every day by, by the daily breadth. And it's going down here right now because breadth is, is negative. Here's, here it is compared to the Dow. And the reason we watch advanced decline statistics is you want to see a divergence. Like when we had the top in January of 22, the very top, we'd already known that there was trouble coming because the advanced decline line was making a lower high. That's right. a bearish divergence. We right. knew that trouble was coming uh, when the top came in. And all the way down, the price was coming down. The advanced decline line was going down. It even showed us a bullish divergence here a little bit in May and, and June of 2022 compared to prices, but that failed. And when you get a bullish divergence that fails, it's pretty bad news. We got another bearish divergence in, in late 2022. We had another bullish divergence when breadth was strong to start the year, but that bullish divergence failed. It's a it's when you get a bullish signal that fails, it's a really bearish uh, overall message. Um, yeah. And so we're seeing I don't use it with these, but, uh, you know, you get a lot of breakout failures like Bitcoin over 30,000 was supposed to be a breakout. It was a, it was a way for with one more thrust and it was terminal. But um, breakout failures, because you have everyone wrong footed before the move uh, that they're looking for is going to happen. So is that the position the market's in right now? We have a failure of the last bullish divergence. Well, I, I would call March. it just just a sign of of poor liquidity. the The key thing about the advanced decline statistics is that every stock gets an equal vote. The, when it comes to the major averages like the Dow or the S and P five hundred, the big cap stocks throw their weight around and they do most of the work. And when liquidity starts to get tight, 
the big cap stocks can be like the little piggies who are not the runs, they're the biggest piggies and they muscle aside the weak ones and they can get their share of the available liquidity. But when liquidity is bad, the broad list will show that. You'll see the, the runs of the litter start to suffer and that will show up in the advanced decline statistics, which are not acting very strong right now. Okay. One of the ways that we use this, and you uh, did a nice mention of it in your introduction, is with the McClellan oscillator. And the way I would describe it, the, the McClellan oscillator is an accelerometer for the advanced decline statistics. So when you're getting positive breath, you'll see positive oscillator readings. When you're getting negative breath, you'll see negative oscillator readings. And uh, you can get to a, an extreme high value. You can get to an extreme low value. Uh, and the extreme low values are, are nice, juicy opportunities to buy at a low risk entry point. But you also see divergences between prices and the McClellan oscillator. And so the, the red lines highlight several divergences. The thing about a divergence, it's not a signal, it's just a condition. So right. for example, in the middle of the chart, this divergence took a long time and it was developing over several weeks and it finally mattered, but it didn't matter right away just because you might've noticed it. So that's the thing about a divergence. It's a condition, not a signal. It won't tell you when the condition is gonna matter. You have to look to other things. Just because yeah, you're going to be early if you go with this, and by the time the turn happens, you're gone. Um, that is, it, it reminds me of like a three drive formation, uh, yeah. where you uh, the first high confirmed by momentum, you have to uh, the momentum has to wane by making higher highs with lower readings, and that's a process that takes time. So that's a, very, that's a very good way to say it. If you look at the path of the prices, it looks more like a bouncing ball. And so when a ball, a ball first bounces up off the ground, it's going up at the fastest rate and you're going to get the right. most acceleration. Then it rounds over and it's decelerating. And before it starts turning down, you, you see that deceleration in the right. momentum indicators. And so we've just recently seen that deceleration as the market's rounding over now and yeah. We had the divergence set up, and then we got a crossing down through a zero, which is the signal. Today? Uh, today, it's, uh, well, the, the downward crossing was uh, last Friday. On okay. Monday, it popped up to a value of plus one. And you can see this chart on our website anytime you want to, mcoscillator.com. And then okay. today, with the negative breadth that we're seeing on uh, April 25th, were, uh, we got almost 2,000 more net declines. So we're going to see the oscillator much more below zero, but not yet down to the nice, juicy, sort of oversold opportunity that you'd really like. That tells me that there's going to be more room for this to fall. Okay. Uh, I heard you on a previous interview thinking that the damage in the market um, is going to happen in the fall because that's when it happens. Um, isn't there a case where everyone's not prepared for the sell-off to take out the October lows that they're waiting for the fall. And it happens by July, uh, which uh, keeps a lot of people wrong footed, uh, just like they wanted to sell in May and go away. And now they're, you know, hundred handles late. It's harder to sell in May and go away now. Um, That's if, true, but you're talking about only one of the two fundamentals. Remember, fundamental number one is how much money is there, and number two, how much does that money want to be invested? You're talking about number two right there. You're talking about people pre pre previewing the bearish news and and the bearish earnings and 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 what the election's going to hold and what the Fed's going to do. That's all affecting number two and what people want. But sometimes number one, the, how much money is there can overwhelm anything that anybody wants and it can be too, a very powerful force. And I think we have that. I'm going to get to that a little bit later in okay. the charts that I brought. Okay. One of the things that I wanted to, to mention since we started talking about breath numbers is there's a, a belief among a lot of analysts that you should not use the overall NYSE breath data, that you should look at just the breath data for common stocks. And I used to believe that too until I looked at the data. And so here's a comparison of the composite NYSE advanced decline line, which includes everything that's listed on the NYSE, and just the common only, just the, which is only about 60% of the total issues. There's a bunch of other things that are in the NYSE that trade like stocks. I'm talking about preferred stocks, rights, warrants, structured products, uh, and there's even some closed-end bond funds that trade on the NYSE. They're about 7% of the list. And so if you really want to know what the stock market's going to do, the theory is that you should watch the common stocks. But 
at, as, a not, as a theory that doesn't match up well when you look at the data, because the whole reason you want to look at an advanced decline line is you want to get a different message from prices, and you want it to be a useful message. Often, we will see at a top that the common only advanced decline line is making higher highs, whereas the composite one is giving us a divergence. And the composite one usually has the better messages. Uh, there was one instance right before the COVID crash when the common only did show us a bearish divergence, and it was right. But it took a world, worldwide pandemic for it to be right. Most of the time, the common only does not give you a better answer. And the same is true if you look at stocks in, a, in an index. I Years ago, I started calculating advances and declines on just the stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, thinking that would be useful. Turns out it's not. Uh, you can see it making higher highs while prices are making lower highs. If you had listened to the bullish message then, it had been wrong yeah. and you'd have been very disappointed. So it is not true what I found that it's better to look at the at the breadth data for the individual stocks in, the, in a major index. It's better to look at the composite because the whole reason you want to look at breadth data is to find out what the marginal issues are, are doing. And, and if they're suffering, then that is the indication that liquidity has gone bad. Okay, and you want to uh, be focused on something that's leading, that is giving you an edge in time, and it looked like that did, that it would make turns prior yeah. to common. One of the things that I've found that's really useful in that regard is I look at advanced decline statistics for high yield corporate bonds. Now these the are HYG. Not uh, well, some of them are in HYG or I or, or uh, HIO or lots. Of, there's some other different bond funds, but this is all of them, not just the ones in the ETF. This is all uh, 900 or so that there are, and, and Fin retracts the data. And these are so useful to watch because these are very terribly vulnerable to liquidity. If liquidity is great, these guys are going to do well, and and so is the stock market. But if liquidity starts to suffer, these guys are going to know it, and they're going to know it first. We saw them topping out in September of 2021. Before the high. Three months ahead of the final top, top in the stock market, we had a big warning that, oh, my gosh, liquidity is dried up. There is big trouble. And this, is, this chart is not quite up to date. Uh, I do have one that is up to date. But this is a, a good one for showing the principle that, hey, if these things are acting strong, even if the stock market is acting weak, you want to believe these things because liquidity is is great, and the stock market might have lots of other problems. But if liquidity is strong, it can get over those other problems. Um, this is a current chart of that same. So you you would argue with uh, Kramer, who says earnings are the mother's milk of stocks, and Tom McClellan says liquidity is the mother's milk. Absolutely. Of there's okay. two fundamentals. How much money is there and how much mon does that money want to be invested? Earnings can sometimes affect whether people want to invest their money, but it doesn't affect how much money there is. It's And the stock market will usually tell you in advance what the earnings are going to look like as opposed to the other way around. So if you're waiting and watching to see what earnings are going to do, you're going to miss the move because the stock market already, already knows that and has already made the adjustment. Oh, today we had many, you know, good earnings reports that it was buy the rumor, sell the fact in the first half hour. They gave it all back. I'm I'm shocked, shocked to know that there's <laughs> <laughs> so this is the current chart of that high yield bond advance decline line, and it's looking rather underwhelming. The stock prices are trying to be in an uptrend since last October. Uh, this has already broken its uptrend. It's looking weak. And if we get a big down day today in these, like we're looking like in the breath, yeah, we numbers, are. it's it's going to go below its moving average and signal that there's trouble in liquidityville. Now, the market might be able to stay aloft on hope and op optimism about earnings. But if liquidity starts to leave the building, it's going to matter in a big way. We can get the same message about liquidity by looking at other marginal things that are not Apple and IBM and, and Microsoft. If you look at things that are, are farther down on the on the on the food chain, like emerging markets, these are yeah. also terribly sensitive to liquidity, and they will show you trouble before it ends up in the S and P 500. When these are making divergent lower highs and lower lows, uh, even though the S and P 500 is doing well, you need to listen to that message about liquidity. Um, we're seeing we're not seeing a huge bearish divergence 
right now this month, this week in April 2023, but we had one back in February to say that uh, there's problems and it's looking just really unhealthy, not not a very impressive look. That's, that's when the narrative was to diversify out of the U.S. because at that time, <laughs> Euro Euro had bottomed, I don't know, about 95 and a half, really, to 109. So uh, people were thinking that they could get outsized returns outside of the U.S. And, Some and people still a, do. Yeah. And this is an easy comparison for just about anybody with a charting platform. To, this is e, EEM, which right. is a, the biggest of the emerging markets ETFs. There are others. I haven't tested all of the others to see if they behave this well. EEM owns a lot of Chinese stocks, so that's yeah. a risk in, in, in evaluating it. But you're not looking at it to own. You're looking at it as a messenger. You're looking at it for for what it can tell you, and and that's in that role, it it plays the role very nicely. Like I use copper, Tom, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, Doctor Copper. You know, he can at times be a fraud, but. Uh, he's definitely underwhelmed with the reopening trade. Well, and there's China. There so many stories out this week about how the world is facing huge copper shortages, and we're going to need to open nine more mines because of all the, the copper wire that we're going to put in all of our EVs. Well, okay, yeah. that's true. But right now, the, the, the commitment <laughs> traders data shows that the commercial traders of copper are not all that optimistic about the, the supposed bullish case for copper. They're rather neutral right now. Uh, yeah. they're not if they if, and they tend to know what they're doing the commercial traders because they're the big money and, and they're in that business and right now they're they're underwhelming in terms of their their response to all these stories about the, the future copper shortages yeah they say all bull markets are roofed in copper yeah. so maybe even uh, you could use it in the case of a bear market rally could be roofed in copper too or by the time you get it, see the stories about how we're terribly short of copper, uh, that's already been factored in. Yeah. Okay. I, I, right. talk, I, I let off talking about how much money is there. One of the things that affects that is what the Fed does. And so I want to look at quantitative easing versus quantitative tightening. And so the green line here in this chart is total treasuries and mortgage-backed securities held by the Fed. And this is how the Fed goes about quantitative easing. And most before the 2008 bear market, this data was very quiet because the Fed didn't do that much. They were not very aggressive and ambitious with what they did. For some reason in 2008, uh, the Fed, led, at that time led by the New York Fed President Tim Geithner, thought it was a good idea to reduce their holdings. They started selling off their treasuries. And sure enough, that yanked a bunch of liquidity out of the market. And we they amplified the severity of the 2008 bear market with that action. That was the first ever quantitative tightening uh, before we ever huh. had QE1, which they started in early 2009, and it fed the bull market. And when they stopped it, we, liquidity left the building and we got the flash crash. So they realized, oh, we should start it up again. And so we had a great bull market in 2011 until they stopped it and, and kept their holdings going sideways. And so prices just chopped sideways. QE3 was the mother of all quantitative yeah. easing and, and it brought a great bull market from 2012 to 2015 until they stopped it and prices went sideways. The, the second ever quantitative tightening event that they did was in, in 2018 and 19, then when they thought they could start pairing and yeah. um, what happened and then, then he was flipped. He flipped, uh, Paul flipped and sang Kumbaya with yeah. Yellen and Bernanke. And it didn't tank the market like it did in 2008, in part because in 2017, we got some tax cuts. And so taxes yeah. were down below 16% of GDP, which is very stimulative. And that offset the quantitative tightening. But they realized when in late 2019, when banks were starting to run into trouble, that they had better start adding a little bit of liquidity. And they added a whole lot more when when wow. when the COVID, COVID crash came. Yeah. And sure enough, we got a huge price response. Well, now we're in the third ever round of quantitative tightening, and it's still ongoing, and it's still having a depressive effect. And in fact, if we look, if we zoom in and look at it, um, the the big they were doing a trillion dollars a month for a while in quantitative easing. And then sure enough, all that money had to go, had to had to have a job. And so it went to work pushing up stock prices. And uh, the, the beginning of quantitative tightening was well enough signaled and other liquidity was leaving such that we've been in this bear market that the Fed is bringing about. Now that bear market and that quantitative tightening got interrupted a little bit when By Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. Yeah. 
and yeah. other banks started looking bad. And so a lot of banks turned to the what's known as the discount window. And so looking at total assets of the Fed, which includes treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, and the discount window, that total assets went up and increased liquidity a little bit. But that too now is starting to decline as they're pulling the, the, the money back from the banks are turning in the money that they borrowed from the discount window, they don't need it anymore. And the Fed is still selling off treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Okay. So, so we're how much money in. is how much money is out there really really matters. There's lots of ways to look at it and measure it and see what it's doing, but that matters more than earnings when it comes to the overall stock market. Now, for an individual stock, earnings matter a lot, but for the overall stock market, earnings is not what drives things. It's how much money there is. Okay, would you say that intermediate term you're bearish at stock market? I am. And if you want to know one reason, I have a fun little leading indication that you can use that gives us uh, uh, answers ahead of time about what the stock market's going to do. This is the Baltic Dry Index. Okay, know it. Yeah. Which is an index of shipping rates for dry cargo, meaning not crude oil. Um, and so right. if you're loading a bunch of iron ore or coal into the bed of a, of a big ship to send across the, the ocean, this is the rate that you're going to, a, a reflection of the rates that you're going to pay. So when it's going up, shipping rates are going up. When it's going down, shipping rates are going down. And the fun thing is that if you shift it forward by 26 trading days, it'll map out for you what the stock market's going to do. And it's been turning down and going flat for the last 26 days. So that means uh, the stock market should be heading down at least to the end of May, which is as far out as this can look. It got into a little bit of trouble. It was saying that we should have bottomed end of March, early April, right here. That, this is what this model said. But it, the stock market didn't have that. Put in a higher low. Yeah. Because we got that injection of extra liquidity yeah. once Silicon Valley Bank um, died. And so that's what helped push the stock market up. And then it continued up as it was supposed to continue up right here. Now, this model is saying we go sideways to downward. But, okay. but before you think I've found the holy grail, this model has some problems. Here's, here's a longer look at it. Same relationship. And, it, and the correlation is very good, except that for all of 2009, it inverted. It worked exactly okay. backwards. And for late 2020, it inverted again. And it inverted it at one point in 2022, but then it's been correlating nicely. So it's amazing, but it is risky to put all your eggs in this basket and believe it all the time. Cycles invert too. Yeah, they uh, do. I mean, you know, I've seen it where I've been looking for a cycle to be a peak and it turns out to be a low, you know, using a Bradley model or something like that. And um, it'll usually invert at the moment you're counting on it most to continue working. <laughs> Yeah. So, Tom, uh, presidential cycle, let's wrap it with that, because uh, I heard you on a prior interview that it doesn't look good based upon what you're seeing. And I know it's pretty far out, so it's almost like a Nostra McClellan. But uh, you think that the market's going to be um, in pretty bad shape going into the 2024 elections. Well, And, it's, and it's you talk about recession also being part of it. Yeah, it's supposed to be in great shape. We're in the third year of a presidential term, which is nearly always an up year. 1939 was a big exception because the Wehrmacht was marching through Poland, and that tended to have a depressing effect on the stock market. We're seeing a similar exception now without, without the Wehrmacht, although we do have war in Eastern Europe. Right. But we have the Fed pulling away a liquidity, and so we're not getting the robust response from prices moving up to higher highs like we're supposed to get. It's the Fed, it's the Fed, it's the Fed. They're pulling away money, and until the Fed relents on that, then that's not going to change. I think the Fed is going to relent a little bit. One of the things that I look at uh, as a leading indicator for short-term interest rates as I look at some data from the Commitment of Traders report, I look at Euro dollar futures yeah. and the Commitment of Traders report, which is not the Euro versus the dollar. This right. is interest rate. 90 and, day pay. It's like yeah. T-bills only in Europe. Think of it as LIBOR futures. It's okay. just, yeah. And and this is actually going away, but for now it's it's great. And, and what the cool thing that this data does, this is the net position of the commercial traders. If you shift it forward 10 months, it models what short-term interest rates are going to do, such as the three-month T-bill yield. It, it, you, I could substitute six months or I could substitute European rates. It would, it would look the same. 
it worked great back here in late 90s and early 2000s. It didn't work worth a darn when zero interest rate policy was keeping the market down, the, the bond market down. But once once uh, Bernanke left and, and the Fed relented, it got back to working again. And it's foretelling a peak for short-term rates in July of 2023. In fact, zooming in here, we can see exactly what it should look like. And in fact, the little little drop that we saw with the Silicon Valley bank collapse, that yeah. matched a nice little drop in the data 10 months before. So how exactly these guys know what the flows are going to be into short-term rates, I don't know. But it's saying uh, top in July of 2023 for short-term rates. The Fed is probably going to raise more. They shouldn't, but they're probably going to do it anyway. But the, uh, then we get to the end of 2023, Rates are going to be coming down because the Fed is going to realize, oh, crap, we went too far and we're going to have short term rates coming down. Now, this indicator is not going to keep working for us because it's already being unwound as everybody moves their euro dollar futures over to the new thing, which is the SOFR, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate Futures, which is the new uh, replacement for the euro dollar. Uh, that just uh, it, that is, has to be wrapped up by June, and so this commitment of traders data will not be working very much longer anymore. And in fact, it may arguably be broken. But for now, its message about a top in July of 2023, I think, is still a valid message for yields or for, for short -term the market interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, I, elite analysis by Tom and. Uh, I encourage people at least check out the trial uh, so you could get used to Tom's writings and see what value it has. And Tom, it's, it's really, it's been a treat for me to talk to you and uh, I hope we could do it again. And I really uh, admire the life path that you took and how fortunate that you didn't have to go on the internet to learn about the markets like people <laughs> do today that your mentors were you know, you genetically involved with you. I, so. I did have a big advantage in that regard. And I, and my, the, the interesting thing about my parents, my, my dad went to Claremont men's college and was a business and finance major. My mom went to Pomona college and they met there. She was a math major in the fifties back when it was not fashionable for young ladies to pursue a math major, but she did because she was wicked smart. And it really took the two of them together uh, because there were no computers. So they were doing this all on ledgers and plotting on graph paper. It took the two of them together to do the work uh, and at that time. If you'd had only one of them or the other, they wouldn't have gone as far. And it was the synergy of both of their sets of, of skills. And I've inher inherited some of those skills from each of them and, and have been able to advance it. And I've had the privilege of getting to work with my father all these years. He's still, he's 88 years old, still doing great, uh, works with me every day and uh, loves what he does, loves the puzzle of the stock markets, loves it, continuing to work on it. He's not off playing golf. He, he, he still, still loves getting in the game. Well, I'll tell you what, your family is a great example of how one plus one can equal 11. <laughs> well, thank you, Dale. All right, Tom. Great meeting you. Thank you, for, thank you very much for edifying our community, Tom, and accepting uh, granting the interview and accepting to be here. Appreciate your time. Really, well, a pleasure, Dale. I'm a fan. I'm rooting for you, buddy. Tom McClellan, everybody. Find him right here. Go to his website, www.mcoscillator.com. It's a contraction of McClellan Oscillator. Okay. But if you McClellan, just go to Tom McClellan, you'll find it. Yeah, and, and uh, check out his website, too. Okay, Tom uh, some real, uh, you know, I think you, uh, that you picked up the mantle and uh, you've added some things that uh, supercharged it. So uh, congratulations to you to, you know, doing what you did. Not easy to step into shoes like you had to. So. Well, thanks for having me on, talking. Dale, and be well. All right, buddy. Tom McClellan, everybody. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Adios.